Welcome to the Hard Water Fishing Show. Jeff and Jason talk tactics, gear, and ice fishing legends. Welcome back. We are all live at the Hardwater Fishing Show, Season 4, Episode 5. It is the first week of December 2020. Hopefully everybody had an awesome turkey day. And uh, my gosh, we've got ice forming. I'm thinking about fishing. Jeff's thinking about traveling with, commuting with the rest of the Minneapolis-St. Paul area up to Red Lake to fish. Right, Jeff? Yeah, I'm, seeing ice, I'm seeing ice fishing all over the place. Red Lake for sure. But I've seen ice fishing in Wisconsin. I saw some pictures today from Max from Hardwater Freaks out there on a hike to his remote lake, catching a really nice, I think, 15-inch crappie. So people are fishing. Do you think that was that picture from this year? I think it was. Okay, maybe it was. Yeah, I'm not sure. So, I mean, it's still be real careful out there, though. It's, it's not thick ice. Which is exactly um, takes us to something we were going to talk about. So on our Facebook page, our friend Northwoods Dave did a nice um, video on the difference between a spud bar and an ice chisel and kind of talks about some of that. So take a look at that. And then I think Max over at Hardwater Freaks did a nice safety video he had posted on their site as well. So to check that out. It's probably on YouTube as well, knowing him. So. And I saw Dave in his video had those orange ice spikes around his neck. Absolutely. I, I think he, he was in a one-two punch through the ice kind of episode. You'll have to watch the video to get the full details, but it was not thick ice. It wasn't. I, I'm kind of a three-hitter kind of guy. I mean, I want I want three three hits on that ice before, you know, the fourth one's fine. It can go through. But I think, I don't know, I'm not a lightweight, so... Yeah, me either, Jay. <laughs> me either. So, so we've been talking a lot, a lot about Northwoods Dave this week. So, uh, he's going to be our guest on the show this week. Yeah, and and Dave did a really nice job of giving us some information about um, the difference between a spud bar and an ice chisel. He talked a little bit about that, so you guys will hear that in the interview. And uh, he gave us some uh, introspective advice about our ice fishing styles, didn't he, Jeff? Yeah, he sure did. So I think. Stay tuned, and and we invited him to do that. It's always good to 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 allow some uh, someone else to critique kind of what your strengths and weaknesses are. It's a growing experience. <laughs> you can't get better if somebody doesn't tell you how it's to get better. Painful right? and difficult as it is, even if they're wrong, <laughs> it's healthy. <laughs> even if they're wrong, we can say that now because Dave isn't on the show right now. Yep, that's fine. So, Jay, what are we? Uh, what do you got in your beverage oh, tonight? You know, I'm glad you asked. So, you know, I didn't look close enough at this one again. So we'll see. So I'm drinking a new beer again because I said I was going to do this. That's awesome, Jay. I know. So this is from Big Grove Brewery. I think it's from Iowa, Solon in Iowa City. And I'm I'm nervous because it's got one of them hoppy things on the top front of it. <laughs> But it's you gotta stop buying IPAs if you don't like IPAs. See, it didn't say IPA on it. It says an American strong pale ale. Well, anytime it's the word pale and ale, that means hops. Well, and it says arms race blurs the line between a pale ale and an IPA. Rich malt character offsets a, oh, a massive hop punch. I should have read close. <laughs> <laughs> Bam! Citrus hops steal the show with her gigantic tropical bouquet. <sighs> strong, strong like a bull. How do they use tropical bouquet and bull in the same sentence? That is impressive. I, I think we better congratulate them. Our that roots is awesome. will, we will maintain. Thirsty happens. All right. Oh, man. It's, all right. We'll, we'll try it. I, I don't know. Here we go. Oh, that was an excellent oh. crack. <laughs> I can smell it. This is new carpet. <laughs> new carpet. It's new- American carpet. American new carpet. All right. Oh, I don't. I don't oh man. All right. I'm gonna try. I gotta buck up and. You know what? That's not bad. 
it smells worse than it is. It's actually not bad. They did really balance out. They they did good. I I think it it's this is the best thing I've drank so far with a hop thing on it. They mix the bouquet and the bowl together. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I've got uh, George Hunter Stout from uh, Castle Danger. And I don't think I've read this before. I have had this beer before, though. Uh, George Hunter Stout is brewed in the honor of our brewer and founder, great-great-grandfather George Hunter, was an Irish immigrant who owned and operated the Iron Range Brewing Company in Tower, Minnesota, up until Prohibition. George Hunter Stout is an American stout with flavors and aromas of molasses, licorice, maple, coffee, chocolate, and cream. It is a big, roasty, full-bodied brew that will stand up to a Minnesota winter. That sounds good. I actually want to try that. They didn't say anything about hops. Oh. Nope. It is a a dark beer. I mean, it's it's like it's good. But better at the brewery than it is in the Yeah, game. yeah. No, this I, I'm actually pleasantly surprised with this. Um yeah. Of course it could be um the fact that I drank brake fluid earlier tonight. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. You you brought it up, so you're gonna have to tell the story. <laughs> so in my free time, I spend my time trying to fix my fleet of old cars and so I was out working on this, my Suburban tonight, doing some brake work on the back because they were making terrible noises. And so I compressed the back brake cylinders or the, the caliper, and then you have to take brake fluid out of the um, out of the master cylinder, right, because it gets too full. So I drink Diet Mountain Dew by the gallon, and so I always have Diet Mountain Dew bottles laying around. So I grabbed a Diet Mountain Dew bottle and put some brake fluid in it, set it down on the table unknowingly, are not paying attention next to the Diet Mountain Dew I was drinking. So I, foreshadowing. Foreshadowing, yeah. So I, <laughs> I, fixed, I finished the project. I shut the hood of the car, and I go. I grab my Mountain Diet Mountain Dew to take a celebratory slug of Diet Mountain Dew, and I grab the wrong bottle with the brake fluid in it. And so I took a slug of this stuff. Oh. I, did not, I did not swallow. <laughs> but, oh. but I got a full mouthful, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> so... The this beer the disclaimer is this beer tastes good at least better than brake fluid. <laughs> I wouldn't tell send that review into the company. We won't get free beer for that. It's better I'm, than. Brake I'm never going to get free beer from anybody except old style. It still is not sending me anything. Um, yeah. Hams hams. Oh uh, I like hams too. They can send me beer too, but. Anybody can send me beer. Yeah, I so maybe I shouldn't be working on cars. I don't know. I should spend more time fishing because that's never happened to me while I'm fishing. That's right. That never has to me either. There's no brake fluid involved. But sometimes in there's northern slime, though, in a beer. Ooh, Which yeah. that would be a toss-up, too, like brake fluid versus northern slime. I'd probably take the brake <laughs> fluid. <to be> honest. <laughs> I know. I clean all the northerns, though. <laughs> okay, moving on. So there, you guys got a side yeah. story. <laughs> All right, so moving on to show business. So patron, not Patron. We have a new patron this week, David M., so thanks for the support. Um, so we'll, getting, we'll get you some hard water stickers out to you as soon as we can. So thank you. We appreciate the support. It helps us pay for the cost of the show. Uh, we, it doesn't, it's not a big operation, but it does have costs, so we appreciate the support. So thank you. In mentioning the Hardwater merch, uh, I ordered a few things. They've been having a bunch of 20 to 60% off sale on our gear, uh, depending on the day for like Black Friday and Cyber Monday, those kind of things. So keep an eye on that if you want a t-shirt or mask or sweatshirt or whatever you want, socks. They got all kinds of stuff out there. You can find us on social media, on Instagram and Facebook, and also our website, hardwatershow.com. We also have a YouTube page where Dave's new video is also on. And you can check out all of our episodes there. And you can email us at hardwatershow at gmail.com. We read everything, even if it doesn't make the show. So thanks for listening and thanks for uh, supporting the show. Yeah, we really appreciate um, the information back and uh, the suggestions. and, And what I really like is on our Facebook page, when people ask a question, other people help them and answer. I think that's great. I, it's a real positive 
vibe on on that uh, Facebook place, and and so I appreciate that people keep it that way. So thank you very much for that. Yes, absolutely. Because we we don't might not mention everyone on the show, but sometimes they get their questions answered even before the show. Maybe by a real expert. You know, <laughs> Maybe by someone that actually knows something. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and this All is right. a good place, I think, just to once again to remind everybody that Jeff and I are just two regular guys, and we really enjoy talking about ice fishing. We've been doing it now for for four years, almost four years on this show. We've done it for twenty years or, or plus ourselves, but we are not guides. We are not experts. We just enjoy and love the sport. There's my disclaimer. Your mileage may vary Absolutely. with any of our advice. It's usually pretty good, but you're right. <laughs> At least mine is. I don't know about yours, Jay. Well, if I shut your Google off, how good would it be? <laughs> can you do that? You can shut my Google off? All right. So we have asked, and we, we've been trying to do this. I think we missed it last time, but we asked, we let people know we're recording, and, and people have submitted some questions and things to talk about. And so we picked some of our favorite ones. Um and and so the first one, Jeff, do you want me to take the first one? You take the first one. You can take the first one. Fav- I think it's it's close to your heart. I feel like this is a question snacks. built for you. Snacks are close to my heart. Yes. So the two two snacks um, that I would say are ice fishing staples for me are iced oatmeal cookies because they're oh, iced yes. and they go so good with Coors Light. An iced iced oatmeal cookie is a perfect pairing with Coors Light. I'm just saying. You can eat a whole whole row of those things. Just like yes. throw them down. Yes. Yep. And they're like what a dollar a package. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think those have even increased in price in 20 years. They're the same price. So like in 1993 dollars today, they're like actually caught. You know, they're like super cheap, right? Because they should be six bucks a pack by now, but they're not. I'm not sure what they're made of, really, though. Don't read the ingredients. <laughs> the package might be from 1993. Yeah. And then beef sticks, beef sticks. That you know that that's I guess would be, you know, stuff that doesn't need hitting up. Cookies and beef sticks. The other nice thing about that is, um, you know, I'm not a big like Cheetos fan when I'm ice fishing. Because <laughs> the cheesy you know, fingers. cheesy fingers, you know, and after you've been snapping minnow heads off, do you really want to lick your fingers to get the cheesy, <laughs> cheesy stuff off? So, I like you dig into that bag of salted, <laughs> half melted, stinky minnows, and you break them in half and stick them on your hook. Yep, and then grab grab a, a Cheeto, a handful, of, and then lick. Ugh. Yeah, so I'm out on that. So that's why I sell more well, cookies. You can grab them nice from the edge and pop them in your mouth, and the beef sticks, same thing. So there's my two favorite snacks. How about you? Well, I would say I do love ice oatmeal cookies because, you know, I will eat at least half of whatever you buy. They don't really transport quite as well as you would like them to in the ice shack. That's probably their one Achilles heel downfall. They can come dusty and crummy, but I would still eat dust and crumbs. If if I ever, like, customize an ice shack, I'm going to put an iced oatmeal cookie container built into the shack. What about like a dispenser? You could just like push a button and it would shoot out a nice little meal cookie. I love the idea, but you and I both know I'll never build it. (laughs) Well, if somebody else out there wants to build us an iced oatmeal cookie dispenser for ice. I will will screw it to the side of that thing. (laughs) That's right. All right. So, so really I would say earlier on in my ice fishing career, I would bring out things like a bag of chips or Doritos, they don't transport real well, right? That was kind of like a rookie mistake there, right? I mean, Truly. You get, your chips might come out in a bag, but they're going to come out in dust. Unless you do the whole pick out. the bag up and just shake it into your mouth maneuver. <laughs> so, so really, I would say um, I have gone to like trail mix because... It's compact and snackable. I do like snacks too, probably more than Jason. Actually, I have a snacking problem. Um, you know, I am more than happy to not have a meal on the ice and just snack all day. Jason will want a meal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's see. So, but the other thing is beef jerky. I am fully on with that because it's it packs easy. You can bring it out. It fills you up a little bit. So I, I'm with you on the beef jerky. Well, because you can or beef sticks. Yeah, you can take that stuff and throw it in your bag. 
my backpack, throw it in there, and if if you don't fish for two weeks and you come back and go fishing, if you didn't eat it all, it's still good. Yeah, and right. same thing with the iced oatmeal cookies. To be honest, they're they're bomb proof, yeah. so you can you can just keep munching on it till they're gone. You don't have to clean it out; just leave it in there, eat them till they're gone. What you don't want to get are those. I remember one time you brought like the pieces and ends or something. Do not, no, no. The big bag of pieces and ends of the the beef sticks. You could you used to be able to buy them at Cabela's, and they sell them other places now. Right, it's just all the snips at the end. Yeah, that's a gut ache waiting to happen. <laughs> they swept the floor and put it in a bag, and you eat them. Yep, pretty much. <laughs> it was like half the price of the other stuff. All right, we, we should... like circus peanuts or beef jerky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we should move on to the next one. All right. How do we convince our wives to let us buy stuff? I don't think that we do. I think it's, um, you know, I, I think there's a continuum of life that happens here, right? Like when you're, do we want to call ourselves middle aged? That's probably appropriate. Uh, I I would think we're being kind yeah, almost at this point. Probably being middle aged. You know what we do now for gear is very different with respect to when we were in our early twenties. You know when you're first starting out in a marriage and life, and your kids are tiny, and you're bootstrapping it, and you're you're barely covering bills. Yeah, you're not. You're not buying all that stuff. You're just you're just gonna make it work because fishing's the goal. The other stuff's just just the dressing, you know. I guess that's how I look at it. So, the best way though, if if you're trying to f- figure out how to make a purchase, that I would I have found, and I can say this because my wife usually doesn't listen to the show. So if my luck, she'll listen to this one, and I'm in trouble. Oh, I'm in trouble. She listens to every I, every <laughs> you show. Have a, you have a, so this is this is going to be heard. So what I say, the number one key is try to relate it to safety. If you can take an item and say, "This, honey, this will make it safer for me to fish," I think you can get that through the minister of finance and war. That's what I call my wife. She's the minister of finance and war. And so if if she can. If she can do that, then you're good to go. I think that's great advice, and I know you have. We have deployed that advice before. We have. It has been done. It has been. It doesn't always no. work. It doesn't always work, but it does work sometimes. So, like, and I'll give you an example: a striker, or, or it's not striker, but that's one of the brands. But there's a number of these float suits out there, right? That you could say, "Hey, this, you know." This is safer. Now, I wouldn't try that one with my wife because she said she would say, well, don't be stupid and go out there when the ice is too thin. <laughs> I mean, that she, she would tell me that. So, But but there would be people out there that would, would take that bait. But, but Jason, no ice is ever safe. Well, it is. It, walking across the street <laughs> isn't safe either. <laughs> yeah, you're right. So. You're right. Three feet of ice, it's hard to justify that float suit. <laughs> it's warm, though. It is warm and it's nice and comfy. Yeah, you're right. Um, they got some nice gear out for that right now. I feel like compared to when we first started to now, there's some really, really nice gear like that out I'm there. I'm still rocking Carhartts. <laughs> yeah, and there's nothing wrong with those, but man, some of those uh, those are pretty nice. My I have some bibs that are just I would call them lower end, and they're really nice too. I think so. The trouble I have is I have those Carhartt Arctic ones. Right, and I'm yep. I'm I don't work outside for a living, so these Carhartts will not ever like. They'll never die. They'll, they'll out, never yeah. wear out. There'll never be a time to say, "Honey, I need to replace these." They're they're worn out because they will not wear out. So I'm just gonna wear them forever. All right, so so here's my one advice um, about convincing our wives to let us buy stuff. I would say it's kind of like a muscle, right? So you don't go to the gym and put on the giant weights if you haven't been working out, okay. right? Like, I mean, you don't go and like not have any ice fishing equipment and buy a twenty thousand dollar wheelhouse, right? Exactly. Right. You start out like, well, I need a nice fishing rod, and then you start out with, I need, you know, an Effexlar. Mm-hmm. That's how I do. Uh, how I think about gear. Right, you got to start out small and kind of build that muscle up. Yeah, and I I agree with you. I think it's about showing that as a priority, you know. So you put it on your Christmas list, you put it on your birthday, you put it on Father's Day, 
or your anniversary and all those little things. And the other thing is, is you try to get her involved in it, right? Because even if, you know, even if she goes once, well, you know, she, you should get her some of her own lures. You should get her her own little tackle box, maybe a new a fishing rod for her. You know, and by then you, you've also, even if she keeps going, great, right? You've got something you can do together. And if not, well, you can keep her stuff. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've failed in that that respect. I have not done well in that. That, but that strategy does work well for people. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have friends, Oli and Northwoods Dave. They they both have wives who ice fish. Yeah, their spouses fish quite a bit. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. My Aaron has not been ice fishing for a very long time. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know when she's been ice fishing last. So. All right. Uh, so, Jay, you want to talk? Somebody was asking us about uh, bringing kids ice fishing. So I, I really like this one because I, I think, you know, there, there's two there's two schools of thought here. One is just that kind of um, good parenting thing of involving your kids in outdoor sports, teaching them something that, that they're really going to love and, and be able to get off, well, get off the screen but so we can stare at another screen. But... Um, <laughs> You know, just doing things with your kids, and and so the big one of the biggest philosophy things I can tell you about bringing your kids ice fishing is making it fun. When you take your kids fishing, the goal is to get them to catch a fish, and that probably means you're not fishing, right? You you might fish a little, but for the most part, depending on how old your kids are, you're jo- you're a guide. You have signed up for to be a guide for the day, and you're gonna make that the most fun thing that those kids have done in in ages. You know, and then you can slowly increase their misery as time goes. No, you can slowly, add, you know, you can dial that back as time goes on. And they really just start liking it for liking it. But really when it first starts, you know, you unless you're going to a really high populated walleye lake, for example, you want to target panfish. You you want to go. And remember, the kid, you know, to a, a young kid, a, a four or five inch pan fish is phenomenal, man. They're going to have a blast. So you want to go where you can catch the most fish possible in the shortest period of time. And you, and you got, and so that that's number one. Number two, you got to keep them warm. So, you know, you got to pay attention to their feet. Number one, keeping them dry. Number two, that that's probably the hardest thing is because kids never understand that they got to stay dry to stay warm. So they're out splashing in the puddles and doing this. So I'd bring an extra pair of socks, extra pair of boots, if you can, let them get cold, let them get wet, and then change them out and say, see, that's why you got to stay dry, you stay warm. And that won't work, so then you just got to take off the next time they get it wet. But um, I could go, we, we actually covered that in a previous show, and I think we could probably do it again sometime, taking kids fishing, yep. because I sure, I, I think it's great. Because then when they get old enough, then they can drag your shack out for you, drill all the holes, and you can stand <laughs> back with, drinking a beer and jigging while they're moving everything. So you it does pay off as time goes on to get your kids involved in things you like and you really get to spend quality time with them. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, I agree. And I think with kids, I think the excitement level of catching that first fish or first few fish is, is at least my experience has been very high, right? I mean, I love catching fish, but man, to watch a kid catch their first crappie or their first big walleye that's kind of pulling them in. I mean, it's it's pretty cool. Oh, yeah, nothing better. We've been kind of family tonight, Jay. We have questions about our wives, questions about bringing kids ice fishing, and now my mom asked a question. And how do we not answer your mom's question? We have to. So it's required. Your mom asked the question of what type of chili is good for ice fishing. And Jason, you have to answer this question because you are really the ice chef. It's not me. It's not me. Like, you're the chef. Like, I, I'm eating granola bars and beef jerky, and that's all I'm eating. You would bring the chili. So so what's your answer to this? Without going into recipes, I think the type of chili you want to bring is one that is not... You don't want to bring a super hot chili, spicy chili out in the ice, Right. You want to be kind of a, a mild to moderate chili because chili affects everybody in a different fashion. And depending upon your access to a bathroom facility, you don't really want to, you know, at noon have a big chili dinner only to have a disruption occur about the time the night bite starts. 
Ooh, yeah, so you got to keep bad. that into consideration. But so specific into type of chili, I think a good brisket, smoked brisket chili, you can never go wrong. And and you always, as the ice chef, you know, you always have the setup with, you have that small burner and a pot and water and a bag. So it heats up. I mean, you kind of have that system down. Yeah, that that's how I do any any cooking anymore. I, I use a pot of water, which you can get out of the lake, obviously. I have a burner that boils that water super quick. It runs on a little uh, canister. And then you, you take, you know, your your food or so in this instance, that chili, and you heat it up. In a, it's in a heavy-duty Ziploc. Put the Ziploc in the boiling water. It heats right up in the Ziploc. Take it out, dump it into a, a disposable bowl, and you're off to the races. That backpack, and it's always in your backpack. All this stuff lives in your backpack. It does. It's like the... It's like a magical, like stuff just keeps on flying out of the backpack. I got chili and a burner and a pot yeah. and, you know, a spoon. It all comes out. Yeah. Of it. It's the same spoon. I just wipe it off and shove it back in there. <laughs> Been in there since like 92. <laughs> all right. Well, we appreciate everybody's questions. Um, it really, the interaction helps keep it fresh for us. And we, I really like it. So, yeah. Thanks. And so gear. We have a few things to talk about on gear. Not a ton of gear things this time, but we do have a few things. Jeff, do you want to talk about your lithium shuttle project, how that's going? Yeah, so it's been a project because it's still not put together, but I'm converting my Helix 7, you know, Project Helix 7 from the boat from my overspending from the summer. Yes. And I'm moving that to the lithium shuttle because it has an ice kit Mm -hmm. and it has my GPS spots and, you know, nice and big. So we're adding it to the fleet of Vexlar Hummingbird and now Helix 7, Hummingbird Helix 7. So I had bought a a lithium shuttle and I bought that because it seemed like the best price point um, for me because I like the carrying case and stuff. Because, you know, if you buy a lithium battery and the carrying case, you can spend three fifty four hundred dollars just on the battery in the case, right, for the Helix 7. But the I thought it was a pretty good deal. The lithium shuttle was two hundred dollars until Jason sends me an email and uh, it was right after Black Friday, right? Was it Black Friday? No, it was year? actually before was, that. Oh yeah, so it was that week, mm-hmm. and it was fifty dollars cheaper than I had bought it for. So and it came with like free accessories, like the you have to buy this thirty dollar plug to adapt into your hummingbird, and then so this one came with a light. And the adapter and the the lithium shuttle. So um, I got that. Still hooking it up, but that's what I'll be bringing out the first time I can get out to ice. Wonderful. So I have um, one thing I was going to talk about, and I, I, I do not have this yet. I put it on my Christmas list, which we kind of talked about doing that earlier. So this is a lithium battery. And... Um, the reason it's on my list is we always do for like family exchanges like a fifty dollar limit, and this thing's fifty three ninety nine. So it pushes it just a little bit, but not too much. But it's a lithium battery. And it's on Amazon is where I found it. But it's a twelve volt sixteen amp hour. Um, but it's you know it's some one of these crazy off brand things from China, right? M I my Addy my Addy is the brand name on this thing. Um, it has really decent reviews, and at that price, I thought I'd give it a try. I, I was going to hook it up to that um, to that camera I got oh, and, yeah. and see how it works. So if I get it for Christmas, I will report back. If I don't, I'm not sure I'm going to spend the money on it, but um, we'll see. And how much was that going for? 53 Jay? bucks. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's a pretty good yeah, deal. Yeah, it's about half. Th- yeah, and the lithium shuttle, um, just to get an idea, that has a 12 amp hour versus you said this was a 16, yep. right? Yeah, so so and the 12 amp hour is supposed to run my Helix 7 for about eight-ish hours. Okay. So um, I'm sure your camera would run a long time. Yeah, we'll see. You know, we'll see. Um, I have no idea. We'll find out. Yeah. And that's if cool. I get it. Yeah, well, we're working on that, that muscle to, you know, it's important for ice fishing stuff for wives to buy us that kind of stuff for Christmas. Yeah. Uh, one other thing that I've been kind of eyeing and thinking about um, in my wheelhouse, the 
table in the back. I have a dinette table. And Jason, you've seen this right in the back where you can sit around and eat and then it folds down. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of RVs have these things. Well, it's got four legs and they're hard to deal with. And every time you do it, it's kind of like gymnastics. Either you're having somebody help you or you have one leg holding up one end of the table and you're trying to line up the poles with the four things. That's just a pain in the butt. So there's a couple of products out there. Um, One of them is called Smith Lift. And I think... um, Another company um, that makes uh, electric parts for wheelhouses um, has one too, but it's a table that goes up and down either hydraulically or electrically to make that just a lot easier. And it's it's actually not that it's hard to lift. It's the whole clunkiness of all those poles fitting into the holes and, and also kind of the strength of it because if you, know, you get a bigger person on there um, like me, <laughs> it can strain the limits of what that is so you're saying it's about safety it's about safety you are totally (laughs) right it is a safety item (laughs) exactly (laughs) all right awesome so i think we're ready to talk about dave right yeah northwoods dave north he's our guest this week northwoods dave is up next as our guest and uh, take a listen and we'll be back Dave is a founding member of the Hardwater Invitational and special correspondent for the Hardwater Fishing Show. He's also an interstate and international fisherman. Dave has a bachelor's degree in biology from St. Cloud State University and has known Jeff since kindergarten. He is also an expert on all things Northwoods. Thanks for joining the show today, Dave. Well, thanks for having me. Jay, are we ready to get some into some deep questions here? Yeah, I, I have a lot of very deep questions for Dave. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to start off with a very important one. What's the ice report, Dave? Well, I actually walked out a little further than I did a couple days ago, yesterday, and just past the cattails, there was two and a half inches of ice. But it was cracking pretty good. And like my arm of the lake is froze, but the bigger part is still open. So... So the guys on Mille Lacs want to know, can we take a half ton out yet? <laughs> uh, with all the wind that we've had, like I've watched this lake out here freeze over and break up in the wind, freeze over the next day and break up in the wind. So it's like, uh, I don't think yeah. my little arm of the lake will stay froze now. It's just going to be a while. Yeah, I think it, and we want people to stay safe, so don't risk it. Yeah, yeah I even had my... Uh, ice picks out yesterday with me walking out there and everything else so that's good a safety is important oh yeah and sometimes the best choice is to uh stay on shore yeah i don't want don't want to be one of those people that uh you have to have the 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 float planes out there and helicopters and uh, you're on the news no we we always want to stay off the news yeah (laughs) always my goal (laughs) so dave uh what age did you start ice fishing? Oh, it was, I don't know, about over 20 years ago, 25 years ago. So that'd make me younger. <laughs> younger. <laughs> yeah, I was, well, moved up like a, I think it was on a previous one, moved up north uh, over 20 years now and started fishing out here and everything. And before that, I know I'm gone fishing with some college buddies and everything like that before moving up here. So it's, it's been uh, quite a few years now. But you didn't really fish as a kid at all. Ice fish as a kid, did you? Not ice fishing. My dad never did. He was always too busy snowmobiling and everything else. And we just never had time. Sure. Too busy with those Minnesota winters with a lot of snow. And now who knows if you get snow or not, but hopefully we get ice. So. Well, hopefully we get a lot of ice before we get the snow. Yeah, that order is good. Yeah, it's, there's a particular order to things. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, this is a really this is the question of questions right here. I mean, we've been leading up to this for probably nearly four seasons, but uh, ice chisel versus spud bar. What is the difference? It seems that you, along with being the expert on all things Northwoods, are also the expert on ice chisel versus spud bar. Yeah, I'm, I have been waiting quite a long time to have this explained to me because you've asked me this question a, a, a half a dozen times and I've provided an answer half a dozen times, not to your satisfaction. So I'm, I've got a 
piece of paper, I got a pen, and this is being recorded. So tell me more. Well, I did meet up with that girl, like you said, last year that sent in that question from Park Rapids. You said meet up with that Dave guy that sent you a question. You tried to answer the question, which you didn't. <laughs> I, think, I think you are Dave, right? <laughs> Well, you said this Jackie girl, if you ever meet this Dave guy in Park Rapids, <laughs> ask him. And I, I explained it to her, and she agrees with me. So so Jackie from Park Rapids agrees with Dave from Park Rapids. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. so did you guys, well, did you have to I'm meet? still like, no closer than knowing the answer. Did you have to meet in town? Like you, she was at her house, and you were at your house, and you had to meet in, the, in town? E- yes, I think that's how it happened, yes. <laughs> Or I got out of my garage where she tells me to go a lot and <laughs> went in the house and uh, met her. So. <laughs> but the biggest difference between an ice chisel and a spud bar is like when you picture that, that red ice chisel up there, that shit said redneck ice chisel up there when you're in a uh, stone, right? Yep. That is an ice chisel. You can pound ice, a spud bar is a solid, heavy black rod that weighs like 50, 60 pounds. And the definition of that is a big blank crowbar. So you would not use your ice chisel for when you're digging, you know, fence posts and trying to get a rock. Would you take your ice chisel down there and try to get a rock out of there or anything? I might use Jeff's ice chisel. Thing. No, you'd use a <laughs> spud bar. Huge crowbar. So, so where do you get, where do you buy spud bars at, Dave? Oh, you can, like, up here? Oh, well, my, my other sponsor, L&M Fleet Supply. <laughs> <laughs> your other sponsor. <laughs> L&M. You or like your them. Fleet, <laughs> fleet Farm or anything like that. They all have your heavy-duty, solid steel rods. Not your hollow. So will it say spud bar on the label, Dave? It'll probably say big ass crowbar. <laughs> <laughs> we use those spud bars that work all the time for when we are resetting those big boat planks on accesses. Okay. You know, and you would not use your little ice chisel prying those planks around, would you? No, I, I agree with that. The, the question I think of when people are testing ice, so that chisel is not. 60 pounds, but it's probably 15 to 20. Right. And so when we say, okay, we want about three good solid hits that are solid and don't go through, you know, if you're saying a spud bar for that same, you're going to have quite a bit of difference in ice, ice thickness between those two elements. Yeah. And your spud bar doesn't have like a little collar on the top to put around your wrist. So if you throw that thing in the ice and it goes through, it's going to be flying out of your hand like crazy. And it's gone. <laughs> so <laughs> is this experience? Have you lost one of those before? Well, you know, uh, I haven't, but uh, maybe some of the guys at work have, you know. Okay. I feel like there's a story there somewhere. <laughs> um, so when you get, when you're out, when you're saying, so if you were telling me, hey, I got three good hits with a spud bar, I think it's okay. That's very different than if I say I got three good hits with a chisel and it's okay. So Not, not necessarily because okay. your chisel is, should have a sharpened tip on it that you wouldn't put in dirt and rock and start chiseling stuff. True. The spud bar has more of a blunter tip. It has the weight, but it's more of a blunter tip. Now, chisel should go through a lot easier than that. So you, you have both of these items, right? Oh, yes. Yes. So can you do a test for us on, on what, is there any difference in, in the spud bar taps versus the chisel taps and what the associated thickness of ice is so that, that we can give people a kind of a conversion chart, if you will? Oh, I could, yes. Uh, it's dark out right now and a little misty rain. Otherwise, That's fine. I'll... Can you do that right now and come back and tell us? <laughs> and I'm in my, my PJs. That's fine. It's dark. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the future, can you can you give us an update? Yes, I can. Okay. So, okay. so in a future Northwoods Dave update, we might hear about how a spud bar works differently than a nice chisel in four inches of ice or something like or that. Not. Or not. Yes. Yeah, and but we have to do this like 
before the ice gets too thick. Otherwise, it'll be yes. After sixty-two hits, I got through the first four bikes. <laughs> versus fifty-four hits and a chisel. Everybody, where's Dave? Time. He's still out there chisling. <laughs> chiseling <ice>. away. <laughs> so, so, so okay. based on this definition, and and now I clearly understand what we're talking about. Uh, I would say that I would always bring a nice chisel because they're lighter than a spud bar. Because I don't really want to be dragging out a, a really heavy spud bar, right? And if you want a decent hole, you want the sharper blade too, not big old chunks or something flying out. If you're trying to chisel open a spear hole or something, you know, you want fine edges. Now you could grind a point on your spud bar for ice fishing, and then you could flatten it out for rock digging. Oh, you could, yes. Eventually it'd be short, but you'd have to (laughs) go get a new one. So it's like a convertible. (laughs) <laughs> then you lose all the weight of it because it's ground down to nothing. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to come up with a <laughs> point in time where you just weld another one on the end of it. <laughs> Keep adding material on the other Dave side. Dave can weld. Dave can oh, weld. yeah. yeah. Yep. All right. I think we've appropriately beat this one into the ground, Jeff. What do you think? <laughs> what is your favorite fish to target? If you can go out and target any fish, what are you going to pick? Well, it depends where I go. Like out in front of my place, I could target walleyes, but I know that's going to be a lot slower finding them. So like in front of my place, out my lake, I like the panfish, mostly your crappies, because you know where you're going to find them and you can have action. But if you go up to Canada or something like that, you want to go for the bigger fish, you know, like your walleyes. Because panfish around here, you can find anywhere. But if you go out of the country, Canada, you want it to go for your bigger fish. And to international fishermen, so we know you do go to Canada from time to time. Yeah, whenever uh, they're going to open up the border again, that'd be nice. So. Yeah, I was going to say you're going to be eating a lot of panfish this year. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, yeah, that's unfortunate. So, But it is what it is. Um, so it, for panfish, Dave, if you had to pick one presentation, one lure... And that's all you could use all day because that's all you do anyway. What would it be? <laughs> uh, normally, I just use like a like your little tiny buckshot. Actually, what I use a lot. Really? So yes, like your oh, what is it? Eighth like ounce a... or less or sixteen? Okay. It's like your smaller buckshot for crappies. For crappies. Okay, and then do you tip that with something? Normally, with the crappie minnow. Normally, it's always just little crappie minnow and stuff like that that I use. So. Full minnow, head, tail. Put the whole thing on there. Whole thing. Yeah. And how do you hook it? Well, I just normally go through like the, the back dorsal fin. Okay. That's how I hook it. So it just does this little wiggle jiggle and then you wait and then the fish come to you. Do, you. do you put a bobber on there? Do you have a spring bobber? Do you have a tickle stick? What do you have for kind of rod presentation do you use? Well, I just use my trying to get all the secrets, Jeff. My normal, <laughs> my normal cheap combos from L and M. Please, no. <laughs> there you go. I don't, I don't have the fanciest stuff, but I catch fish, and normally I just, just watch my vex. Otherwise, I do have my light rattle reels down, set light, you know, in my other holes when I'm in my ice house, mm-hmm. you know. Otherwise, you just sit there and jig and. And oh, no you don't bobber. Have to go out. No, normally no. No. Hmm. But you don't have to go fishing all day long just to get one or two. You can go out just at the prime time and catch them. Right, Jeff? That's right. How does that make you feel, Jay? I, You know, I'm just here to interview the guest. <laughs> you remember that time you came up, Jeff? And uh, uh-huh. we, we tried fishing. It's like they ain't biting. We went back to my place and watched the yard, largest yachts or something out there all day long. And went out there for like an hour right before sunset and nailed the crappies. Yeah, it was like uh, Robin Leach's, you know, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous Boat Edition or something, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we did. So let's, we... Move back, let's move back to walleyes when he goes up to Lake of the Woods. What do you, what do you use usually on Lake of the Woods today? Moving on. What do you usually well, use on Lake of the Woods if you had to bring one lure along? What thank you for you? keeping us on track, Jason. Yep, I am. Oh, well, lately I've been using uh, a lot of those uh, the Northland 
glow spoons. Yeah. With that glow in there now. So that's what I've been using the last couple of years. I always go back for, you know, your buck shots and different colors mm-hmm. of your buck shots. You got to switch it up once in a while. So, and you just watch your backs and fish for them. So what do you, what are you putting on your lure for bait up there? Are you using any bait? Well, you use, uh, normally I bring those frozen slime bags of fat heads. <laughs> yeah, those are better. <laughs> <salted. laughs> God. Yeah, those are great. But they work really well. I mean, oh, they do, but they're just nasty. Yep. But, you know, what else do you do? Yeah, so you take so, minnows out of the, you, you buy minnows and you salt them and put them in a bag and throw them in the freezer, right? Correct. Yeah. I, you know, I've actually been doing that. I have a couple of bags. My wife finds them every once in a while. She's like, what in the heck is this? Well, don't <laughs> worry about it. Put it back. Um, you know, like in the summer, instead of ditching your extra minnows, Oh, yeah. What I freeze do them. is I, I just throw, you know, I freeze them up and then use them in the winter. And that's important. Like yep. if you are going in international trip, um, typically you can't bring live bait across the border. And when we're in Canada, sometimes it's really hard to find bait, you know, I mean, it might be late or there's nothing open or whatever. So, so it's, it works and it's easy. And we've had really good luck with that up there. So, I mean, it, it's hard to justify the nonsense of trying to keep live bait alive and find it and drag it around. So what, what's the next question, Jeff? So, you know, now that we know that you like to target walleyes and crappies and we know some of your tactics, um, tell us a little more advice, like kind of an approach. I mean, we talked about specific uh, presentations and stuff, but what's your general approach to fishing well, I normally go on Ron's GPS and look where the fish go. No. <laughs> <laughs> look for the fish symbol. We all do that. Dave. I think we all do that. <laughs> no, but a lot of times, you know, especially around here, you look for <clears throat> either where the weed lines are, where the breaks are, you know, the drop-offs. And if you want a gradual slope or do you want a steeper slope, you got to figure out like out here, a lot of times it's just a slow bowl. But in winter, seems like your crappies are just at the bottom of the sand beyond the weed lines. So they're sort of in the deeper water, not much of a break, nothing like that. So, but then, so you're looking for that sand transition off the weed line? Yes. That's what I look for here. Otherwise, you know, if you're looking for walleyes, you want maybe a sharper break or rocks or some type of hiding area like you know like rocks bed or something way down let's say you find this spot you got this hard you're fishing for walleyes you got the hard break and the rocks are there do you usually hole hop a lot or are you more of a uh, park it and and fish kind of kind of fisherman well (laughs) i normally just drill my holes and i sit there and fish and i have other people that i know around me They'll be drilling holes and drilling holes and drilling holes and drilling more holes. <laughs> and it seems like, yeah, I just sit there and fish and they just come to me after a while. It's, it's just, like a fish whisper. Yeah. Well, you know, it could be just the, the time <laughs> of the day. They're just not biting at that time because it's not prime time, Jason. You just have to wait for them. Then finally they bite. And I'm actually fishing, not just running around drilling holes. So, but at what point do you say to yourself, self, I've sat here two weeks and I haven't caught a fish. Maybe I should drill a different hole. I mean, when, when do you, if you would ever decide to move Dave, what, what would be, what would cause you to do so? Well, if, you know, I've done it with my ice house out here after a couple hours, I'm not, if it's not prime time, then I said, heck with it. It's like, I'll come back later. But if it's prime time and there aren't biting, mm-hmm. the next day I will move to a different spot during prime time. Got it. Fishing. So, so it's about moving during prime time. You're not going to, you're going to sit through at least a prime time before you decide to move. Right. Yeah. So, so then what if you're on a trip where you only have three days? So you only have three prime times to hone this, hone this in. You got yeah. three shots. Three shots? Well, you got three days to catch your limit. Okay, there you have it. And during the day, you just, what, sit around and play cards? 
What do you do during the day then if you're only fishing prime time? What do you do the rest of your day? You watch oh. TV shows about yachts. Oh. Or, you, <laughs> or, or you do little projects around the house and yeah. everything else. Or like Ron always has little projects up there or something like that. Okay. Sharp, sharpen your hooks, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. What, so, it's important to have sharp hooks, Dave. So this was a question I kind of asked during our prep, but I'm going to ask it again during the show. What is the biggest mistake you've seen Jeff make over the last 20 years? <laughs> Sit there and have his hook in his hand all the time, trying to sharpen them. He sharpens his, see, I never knew that about him. He sharpens his it's hooks. Like, I've never, ever, all the time. It's like, oh, geez, I missed that one. It must have a dull hook. And it's like, by the time he gets done, he has little nubbins. There's <laughs> nothing left. <laughs> I have never sharpened a hook in my lifetime of fishing. I, I'm so. going to defend the hook sharpening because I do think having a sharp hook is important. When you set the hook and it's sharp, it goes in versus bounces out. I think it's important, Dave. Well, if I remember last year at our hard water invitational thing, uh, <clears throat> I outdid you guys and uh, I had the same hook in I did all summer long. <laughs> I know. Winter long fishing up there, and those treble hooks were bent out. And I just take your leather man and bend them back and bend them back, and it's like they still worked. Well, good. So, <laughs> so what? What in twenty years of fishing is the biggest mistake you've seen me make, Dave? I mean, I'm I'm willing to to enter into some introspection here, some feedback, some reflective communication. What do you got for me? I'm thinking for you, Jay, your organization. What? What are you, my fifth grade teacher? <laughs> <laughs> all i know is you have this one one backpack with everything in it and you are just yeah. pulling it out there's hooks yeah. all over the place yeah it's all in there like that. it's like oh that is it's they're just it's just a mess you yeah, can never it's my backpack anything. it's it's where everything is at and you're you end up you have to take everything out of it yeah to look for a bobber it's at the bottom <laughs> And it's like if you just have like a, a little, you know, they make little containers to put lures in. They don't have to be all just, I don't know, strung out all over the place <laughs> and you come out with like eight in your hand stuck or something like that. <laughs> so, And it's the same backpack for 20 years. <laughs> it is. I've had, that was the backpack I had in high school. I oh. use it for ice fishing. So They don't make that. them like that anymore. <laughs> they don't. Now, now. That was when Jan Sport was actually made in the United States. <laughs> What's that, Dave? All those hooks stuck in there. With all that <laughs> lead hooks stuck in it, yeah. I, I tell you, <laughs> things like it, that thing's invincible. <sighs> all right. I will actually take your organizational thing under advisement. I will tell you, I actually cleaned that backpack out here two weeks ago to get ready for ice fishing. Yeah? I found a granola bar. A granola bar? Yeah, from last year. That's oh. so good. I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> you I may have eaten. New. <laughs> all right. Well, I, I will accept that feedback. And, and I do have one more question because in all fairness, we should ask him about Oli, even though Oli's not here to defend himself. Oh, what, what would be the biggest thing you would give? If Oli would listen to your advice, what, what advice would you give Mr. Olson? <laughs> Just fish. Don't sit there and organize. <laughs> like you, I'm saying organize for him. <laughs> You have to put that lure in that spot just that way and have a have a freaking tape measure and make sure it's in that spot the correct <laughs> way. He needs a caliper with him when he does that stuff. It's like <laughs> just don't be so neat neat, you know. Like we all say with him, uh, that's Oli Shack. He's gonna pack it because he has oh, a yeah. certain way. So <laughs> But you know, for years I always fished with Sean and I we'd get ready for these trips. And it was a lot of times back in the early days for a long time, it was one of the few trips I could take. Right. So I hadn't fished since the year previous ice fish the year previous and any of the gear. And so I'd show up with this rod that was just a ball from the last time and with lures stuck in that backpack. And Sean would look at me and he'd do his classic good grief. <laughs> he'd, he'd hand me a fishing pole and he'd hand me a lure and I'd fish. And it was, you know, it got, you know, after a while, I'm like, well, why would I even get my own crap ready? He's going to hand me a rod. So it worked out <laughs> good for a lot of years. Now I do. I have my own stuff. Oh. But in those days, I brought things with no intention of ever using. I had the same line for like five years. 
Uh, yeah, what's wrong with that? Oh, well, um, it was probably 20 pound test, Dave. Oh, okay. <laughs> If it was six year old, six pound test, then we'd be just fine. That's, but that's what I used in those days. Yeah. Twenty pound hmm. test. Not everything. So besides your rod and reel and tackle, what is your number one tool out there? Like what what would you just give up and walk back to the house if you didn't have with you? <laughs> uh, ice auger. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good point. Okay. All right. Okay. So we yeah. drilled our hole. And I might be leading you down a path here, but you drilled uh, your hole. You brought your auger with. What What else do you need besides your rod? I would need a Vexilar. Yeah. Just to tell you depth. Yeah, I've done it old school with like your little squeeze on weight or whatever forever, but you can tell where the fish are on the lake a lot easier. Then you don't have to worry about a bobber freezing in and everything. So That always reminds me of that story of this is probably – what, five years ago? I don't know. We get out there and usually, not all the time, but when we fish a lot, Dave and I will fish together and Jason and Sean will fish together. I, I don't know why. That's just what we do. Um, we do <laughs> switch it up Sean's got all sometimes. the stuff I need. Yeah, <laughs> Sean's got all the stuff we need. But this, um, <laughs> he even packs me a little bag with the little tools and stuff. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's a, I got a good show over there. I don't want to give that up. It yeah. works really nice. So so this this year, um, you know, we all have XLRs, but um, this was the year of the FLX28, right, the, the new model. So we get out there. Dave pulls out the, the, new, the new rig. I mean, it was pretty nice. Big upgrade from the FL8. It was about, what, Five minutes later, and Oli pulls out the FLX 28 also. I thought that was pretty cool. And then I turned on my Markham and messed them both up. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Actually, they didn't mess up those 28s that no, much. No, not as bad. Not at all once you got the IR or the inter- interference rejection going. Yeah. And, then, and then somebody, after years of complaining at the hard water, somebody stole my Markham out of my garage, and I still have questions over how that occurred. I, <laughs> I don't know. I, it's highly suspect that they complain for five years and then it just goes missing from my garage. I don't even know where you live down there. Yeah, you can Google <laughs> it. I'm on Google Earth. <laughs> well, yeah, because that back back in those days when we had two FL8s, I had my Hummingbird and you had you had your Markham, which worked really well, but usually caused interference with FL8s. It just oh uh, yeah, it just it, wreaked destruction on them. So so if you don't if you want to fish by yourself. And your buddy has an FL8, get a Markham because you'll be fishing outside. <laughs> you know, or he will. Depends on who owns the shack. In yeah. that case, my case, I was outside. So yeah. I was shack. yeah, I think we're ready for a legend. We were almost getting into legends there, so we got to be careful. I know. I'm actually really excited to hear Dave's legend. Let's see. It happened in Canada. Oh, Canadian legend. It was three of us. Sort of sounds like my last legend, I said. <laughs> Ron Scott and I again. <laughs> so to set the stage, we woke up in the morning. It was like 25, 30 below out. Whew. And we had like, I don't know, half a foot of snow that night. So basically you look on the lake and with that wind blowing, you can hardly see anything. We decided to wait a little bit for prime time fishing <laughs> to go out. So we went out there and well, put it this way, you know, like Ron, he throws everything out of his shack and his, took his Vexilar out of his bucket. And he goes, Dave, grab my bucket. It's like, I start running. It's like, that thing is going like 25 miles an hour. <laughs> he unhooked his snowmobile and chased it down three to four miles away. Wow. Because <laughs> the wind just took it and it was gone. But to get to the real thing, it's like, okay. It was windy. It got dark. And Scott didn't want to leave because, oh, geez, he's still marking them. So, I like Scott. Yeah. <laughs> but it was windy, you know. And it's like, okay, we, Ron and I haven't seen anything. Scott's, oh, just marked another one. Well, we'll give you another 15 minutes. And that time is like 25 below again. Windows are all frosted up on the inside of your shack. The wind's still blowing. So finally, it's like, okay, let's go. So packing up your shack, and once you finally take your poles down your shack, 
the shack really starts fluttering because it's not expanded. And I open it up and it's like, it is snowing like nothing. I couldn't even see Ron 30 feet away from me. Oh man. All I, all I look over is see a, see a little headlight come up and it did 180 degrees backwards. Scott opened up his shack and the wind caught him and he was still hanging on. It flipped him all the way back over into a shack. Oh my gosh. Oh my the wind. <laughs> so of course when we finally get everything, you know, situated. The front, I started my snowmobile. I couldn't even see my headlight. The drift was over the front end of my hood of the snowmobile from the snow. So you couldn't even, I had to brush off the headlight. And when we started back, luckily he had his GPS. He marked the ice ridges where we crossed earlier in the week because you could not see two feet away. Our skis Hmm. were almost underneath his mud flap. And I could sit probably on his shack and drive my snowmobile back. Because if you got any further than that, you lost him. You could not see headlights, taillights, nothing. So I call that the flying V. (laughs) (laughs) And I think that night, once we finally got back and we made it back, it was rough. Clearly you're here. (laughs) I, I think that night we had a couple cocktails before we even unloaded our shacks or yeah. anything. How so, far out were you, Dave? Of course, about eight miles by the box spring. Yeah, all the way, miles. all the way. Yeah, yeah. Holy cow! So when you say the oh. flying V, are you talking about like a Mighty Duck style, where you have like mm-hmm. one snowmobile and then two two on the sides? Well, Ron was leading. I was on one side, and Scott was on the other, and our skis were almost touching his snowmobile and his shack because. Otherwise, you'd lose them. Yeah. So, so that was an adventure. You know, that, that GPS units kind of provide that layer of security up there. So, you know. Yeah, if we didn't have that, because it marks the buoys and everything that are sticking mm-hmm. up with, with a compass, you could have just rode right into an island. Yeah, you'd rock. almost just have to stay put. Yeah, because you could not see two feet in front of you. Mm-hmm. Your headlights from your stone bill did basically nothing. Yeah. So, yeah, it was an adventure. It, it always is. No, and isn't aren't that's like always the coldest thing when you get done fishing at night and then you have to pack down. Oh, bird. well, the worst thing was, you know, your uncle Ron, how he sort of gets places and throws everything out. Really? It was sort of, it was, it was sort of <laughs> like, you know, trying to find stuff in an avalanche, you know, people in avalanche. <laughs> Using a stick. Lions trying to, I think this is a bag here underneath the snow bank here. I think your auger is right here. Oh, God. Yeah, I oh. can, I don't, I never operate like that, but I've sure <laughs> seen it, seen it happen. Jeez. Sure, sure. So. Well, thanks, Dave. That, that's a great story. I, I think anybody that has been up in that part of the country will certainly appreciate what that felt like. And well, I want to. I certainly want to thank Dave for taking the time out to to talk to us tonight. Um, it was great to to always get to talk to an old friend and and for him to have a chance to share some of the things he thinks he knows with us. Exactly. Some of him he does know. Oh, he definitely does. He fishes more than you oh and I. Oh my God! Do. Yes, yes, he does. Yes, he does. Well, I want to thank everybody for listening tonight. I certainly appreciate it, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Tight lines. Cheers. Bye. You've been listening to the Hard Water Fishing Show with Jeff and Jason. Say goodbye. One of the most unique podcasts on the planet where we talk about tactics, gear, and ice fishing legends. We'll be back soon. Bye-bye. Till then, signing off. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.